Welcome everybody to the um, Transportation Advisory Board for the City of Longmont on the 8th of August. Um, this is a call to order. We will go to roll call. Taylor Wicklin. Osborne. I'm here. Patrick Hinterberger. Present. David McInerney. Present. Steve Lehner. Present. Next item on the agenda is our 2022 election of officers for chair and vice chair. I'm going to let Phil Greenwald handle the nominations and the counting. There it is. Sometimes people disconnect that stuff. So. <laughs> Again, Phil Greenwald, Transportation Planning Manager with the City of Longmont. Just wanted to uh, let you know we do need to do election of officers tonight. And so we are looking for nominations for chair and vice chair. So if you'd like to, we can start with nominations for chair. Is there anybody who's interested and would put their name in the hat or would select someone else? In recognition of his admirable work as vice chair, I nominate uh, Steve Lehner to become chair of Longmont's Transportation Advisory Board. Are there any other folks that would? I just wanted to second that Perfect. nomination. <laughs> Sounds good, thank you. Are there any other nominations as, the, as this time is still open? Great, with that we'll close the nominations and um, go to elect. Uh, with only one person out there. So um, um, all in favor of Steve being the chair, Steve Lehner. Aye. It's unanimous. Can we, uh, thank you very much. And we all take uh, any nominations for vice chair at this point. Anybody want to throw their name in the ring for that one? Yeah, I would like to, ooh, a little close. I'd like to nominate uh, Councilperson Osborne for Vice Chair. I guess at this point, we'd like to see if you accept the nomination. OK. Anyone else? I would accept the nomination. Wonderful. Anyone else? That will close nominations and accept a motion for Liz Osborne to be vice chair of the TAB. A motion and a second would be great. I'll submit that motion that Liz Osborne be elected vice chair of the board. I'll second that motion. All in favor? And I'm taking Steve's spot because he's officially chair as well. So sorry, Steve. That's fine, Phil. <laughs> Everybody voted as in the affirmative. So congratulations, Vice Chair. OK, with that done, uh, we'll move on to the approval of minutes of the preceding meetings of uh, both June and July. Can I get a motion to approve? Or I should first ask, are there any questions or uh, comments about the prior meetings minutes? 
as staff, we just want to make the comment that even though you, if you were not at the meeting, you can still vote in the affirmative to approve the minutes. You just can't make any amendments to the minutes. So just to be clear on that, because we had a little issue last time. Thank you. No, thank you, Phil, for the clarification. So any, any comment on the minutes? I have a few editorial comments on the July minutes. The first would be um, on page four, the third bullet item, sidewalk rehab. And under that, the fourth open bullet should read right of way, three words, rather than right away, two words. Um, on page six, the fourth bullet item, cost strategies. Beneath that, the second open bullet, uh, spell bus with just one S. And finally, on page nine, second paragraph, in the last line, uh, the last line should contain the word youth, Y-O-U-T-H, not U, Y-O-U. And that's it for my comments. Thank you, Council Member McInerney. Any other comments or anybody else? Okay, can I get a motion to approve the minutes from both the June and July meetings? I move that we approve the minutes for both the June and July meetings. And can I get a second? A second. Great. All those in favor, raise your hand. Perfect. Okay. Um, we will move on to communications from staff. Phil, I'll hand it over to you. Great. First of all, I just wanted to uh, let you all know that we received uh, Joe Long's resignation this afternoon. He has a number of personal issues going on right now, so he has officially resigned from the board, um, effective uh, immediately. So we forward that on to the city clerk and we'll wait to hear what she has to say about the future of that position and when we need to fill it. So uh, as you know, we just went through the process not long ago. <laughs> we have two new members and uh, that happened in July, or that started in July. So we, we're interested to see what the next process is gonna be and we'll let you know how that goes. Um, Second, just wanted to um, have Caroline Michael come up. She's one of our civil engineers and have her explain or just give you a little update on the traffic mitigation program as there's a number of things happening this summer on that. Hello. Hi, I just wanted to give you an update on where we are on the traffic mitigation program because I know the board has expressed interest before. Um, we currently have an ongoing project on Gay Street from Mountain View to 17th. Um, the most recent meeting we had on that is I met with some folks in person in the 1300 block, which is north of Mountain View, um, about a proposed um, speed table near some of their properties, kind of gave them the opportunity to voice their you know, yay nay about that. So. Um, see if we need to move it if we need to, which it looks like we might want to do, end up doing that. Um, so the next part in that process will be to, it, the, our process calls for a second public meeting where we present the final proposal and then it goes to a neighborhood vote. Um, other than that project, um, we have received a few more like applications like this summer for future projects. And um, I don't have the full list in front of me, but that includes Bowen Street, um, 3rd to 9th, uh, Missouri Avenue, um, Renaissance Drive, Maxwell Avenue, Redmond Drive, East 5th Avenue, and I think I'm forgetting the last one. But um, those are still in the data collection phase, so we haven't made like any calls about whether or not we're going to move forward with those to like physical mitigation or even if we can or how many we might be able to manage because it does become 
a constraint with time and budget. So that was all I had. Thank you very much. Next we'll have uh, Ben Ortiz come up and just talk a little bit about the Zero Fare for Better Air in August campaign that's going on. Thanks, Ben. Certainly. Thank you, Phil. Um, my name is Ben Ortiz, transportation planner. So um, <clears throat> as many of you may know, uh, the months of June through August are Colorado's high ozone season. And so um, in anticipation of that, the um, Colorado legislature passed Senate Bill 22-180, which is for programs to reduce ozone through increased uh, transit. So SB 22-180, it earmarks um, approximately $58 million and um, uh, with the intention of providing 30 days of new or expanded uh, transit services throughout the entire state of Colorado for those transit agencies that are interested in applying. Um, so RTD, our local transit provider, they are uh, implementing the zero fare for better air program. And their intention is to incentivize transit ridership. And with that, all transit services throughout the RTD district, including local bus, express, regional, um, sky ride service, as well as light rail, light rail service, they will all be free to all riders throughout the entire month of August. And, um, and so RTD is not the only one participating. I did look at the list of transit providers um, that have taken advantage of this application, and there are many all over the state. Um, and that concludes my presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer those if I can. Any questions for Ben? Looks like we have one. Yes, um, thanks for the presentation, Ben. Longmont already provides um, free RTD service within the city, I guess by paying a lump sum to RTD, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Uh, the city per bought up the fare box revenue for the local services. And those are, those you can tell which ones they are, they're the 323, 324, 326, and 327 as well as the flex ride service, accessoride service. Is it still? Okay, Access, I, I stand corrected, the accessoride service. Does zero fare for better air mean that Longmont will get a rebate of one twelfth of that money? It's, I'll, for the, answer, I'll answer that real quick. Go um, ahead. Yeah, we, will, we will not, it wasn't in our uh, original intergovernmental agreement that we'd get that those money Money's back, but we are going to negotiate for our next, our next um, IGA negotiation will likely include that sum in there as well. And I should just correct, the flex ride will be free under this program as well as the, and that's the call and ride service that RTD provides. The access ride was always free. People don't really know about that, but that's always been free. The local bus is also part of that buy up that we have. And actually Boulder County, but sitting behind me tonight is integral in the pilot of that project. So without them, we probably couldn't have got it started, but it did get the ball rolling. Um, but also the bolts and then the LD3 that goes to Den, well, goes to Broomfield is also free. Great, thank you. Um, may I add one more thing? So um, the city of Longmont will be rebated uh, one twelfth of what we paid for eco passes for the city employees for the next eco pass purchase. I had a quick question. Um, how are we getting the information out of zero fare to the ridership public in general? Is it through just regular print media, online stuff, or is there a concerted effort to get that information out? Yeah, all of the above. I mean, there have been a number of stories in the print media as well as online. Um, RTD has made a concerted effort to reach out to all their partners. We have internally um, uh, promoted the program amongst the city staff as well as the public information office has engaged in outreach to, to all of the city using their various venues. Great, thank you. Really briefly, I wanted to just chat a little bit about, um, Carolyn and I have been working on what's called the airport road 
uh, project where we're working with Boulder County and the Colorado Department of Transportation to realign the section of airport road that's between the two sections of diagonal. So if you think about the Longmont bound, northbound diagonal, or it's, it's, it's technically northbound, but it's more east bound. And then the southbound or westbound diagonal to Boulder, there's a section of airport road that has two directions right now. It's, it's bi-directional today. In order to keep that operating safely and uh, efficiently in the future with bus rapid transit, we need to change it so it's all uh, one way northbound and no southbound direction of travel on that. So we wanna make sure we get that out to the public that you know about it. We're trying to get it out to the public as well with Boulder County and uh, CDOT's help to get that information out to the people that use that the most. It's, it's kind of an interesting way of traveling because if you're going south on airport road to then go north on the diagonal, it's, it's almost like a U-turn, but people are doing it and people do need to um, access Ogallala Road, which is this, the, the county road that's across um, the highway there. And that is a dirt road, but, um, but to whatever ends this is, it, it really does save us a lot of money in the project and saves us probably more crashes. It's a safer situation to not have a signal on that northbound leg at Northbound Airport. So uh, just a couple of things, and if you want any more information about that, please let me know and I'll send that out to you. And we've got a lot more information on the traffic that's gonna be impacted and those kind of things, but we wanted to get that out in front of you uh, sooner than later. So um, just to let you know that that's happening. So any questions on that stretch? Or do you would you like to see the full report? I can send that out to you tomorrow morning as well if you'd like. Uh, the bigger report if anybody's interested in kind of how many cars are affected it's it's I'd like to see it it's about 400 to 500 vehicles per day um, if you consider there's 10 to 10 to 15 times more than that traveling on the diagonal but it gives you an idea of order of magnitude um, that's not a lot of trips per day technically but it is people impacted so we'll send that out tomorrow or tonight quick question um, as somebody who's used the, the dirt road on Alala to get over to North 95th, um, are, is 95th part of the city of Longmont? In other words, I, I know that there's a, there is a small kind of community over there, and I would imagine they're probably the ones who access that the most, um, probably to get to you know some of the things either off of airport and, and otherwise. So I didn't know if you had any. Yeah, I should mention I should mention that there'll still be a right in right out for Ogallala Road onto the diagonal. So people coming from Boulder will still be able to turn right and still access Ogallala Road. And people from Ogallala will still be able to turn right and go north into Longmont. So that won't be affected, but the other other ways will be affected. But there are within, uh, I think it's within less than two miles each direction, there are opportunities to make U-turns on the diagonal. 95th Street technically isn't in the city of Longmont. It's in Boulder County. This whole section of street that we're talking about is actually in Boulder County as well, and it's CDOT controlled except for the signal, which is the city of Longmont signal, which is, so it's an interesting cross-jurisdictional thing that I don't think anybody knows about, but <laughs> we just maintain it, correct, sorry. We do not own it, we maintain it. Thanks, Jim. Um, so that's kind of it for that one, and I will send out that information to the TAB later tonight. Um, and I just wanted to finally do one last transportation, imp oh, did you want to say? I wanted to say one more thing about transportation improvement program. We've been talking about this almost every month now with this group. Just wanted to let you know that we did get approvals from the Southwest Weld sub-regional forum for our project on County Line Road from 17th North to 66. And I probably should have told Tom that because he's the project manager, but um, we did get we did get formal approvals from that from that board, but we don't have we don't have formal approvals from the Dr. Cog board yet. So once we get those approvals, then it'll be official. I'll tell Tom about it. So, <laughs> so thanks for your time on those. If you have any questions about the TIP uh, updates too, I'd be happy to take those. But otherwise, uh, we've got a full program for you tonight. Uh, three items on the agenda that will take a little bit of time. But any questions so far? Yeah, we, we're going to, I think number six is we're going to do, uh, we do have somebody from the public here to speak. And then we'll jump into the, um, the information items, if that's OK. Um, so Steve Nix is here to speak. Thanks. My name's Scott. I'm that's, sorry. That's Scott. okay. So uh, 
I'd have to say it was 30 years ago, but right now I was a TAB member. So I live at uh, 10694 County Road 1, so I'm on the east side of town. I've always lived on the east side of town, so um, we've, back in the day, um, we had issues with all kinds of different transportation things. In fact, I was on the group that came up with the sales tax, and I'm so saddened by how it's morphed into something totally different than what we ever expected. You know, as well, it became permanent, and, and uh, that was just nothing that the group invite, in, in, envisioned. So um, I had a lot to say. I don't know how much time I got, but I don't know why I picked this meeting to come to. <laughs> it's so much more official than meeting upstairs in a conference room, you know, when we used to do it. Of course, we didn't have city council um, membership, and and it was always pretty pretty low key, but we'd have some people from the public show up and it's amazing how how they got their stuff done by showing up to meetings. So I thought, instead of just calling into people I know at the city, I'd, I'd show up and, and try to voice my concerns just to see if they're even on the radar. Um, my wife, she's been jumping me because there's no painting at the eco center for parking. <laughs> and I don't know who you talk to, to to get them to paint parking spaces, but everybody parks crazy when they're going to the eco cycle so so i thought i better bring that up maybe that'll help <clears throat> the uh, the other thing is I, would, I think what fired me up was the painting on third avenue going eastbound so um i actually talked to alden the city engineer that's in charge of the project and basically 80 percent of the people all go east but the way they've got it striped now they stripe it to go into that subdivision so if you're in the right lane and you don't get in the left lane quick enough, you end up getting shut off from getting over. So I talked to many people that end up going into that subdivision accidentally because they can't get over and get in that left lane to make the double turn. So I just wanted to bring that up. The other thing was, is bike paths, the name of, the, the name of these paths are bike paths, right? So why would they have a bike lane painted on the edge of the travel lane because i would think that you would want to move the bikes off the travel lane onto the bike path we don't have a lot of bicycle traffic on third avenue on the road itself from my experience and it just the striping is is quite different than it's been in the past they give that three feet buffer they painted it up and i think the old way was better so um, one of the other things, I mean, 35 years ago when we worked on the sales tax, one of the issues was overpasses over the railroad tracks. Now, for us that live on the east side of town, we're always waiting for trains if you do anything on the west side. For people that don't live on the east side of town, it's really not an issue. And I think politically, you guys have so much power when it comes to persuading the public or elected officials. I didn't realize that when I was when I was young because I was I was just learning. But if I could go back in time, you would you would really use your position to get these projects in a sense they're more public generated than staff generated. Staff's got their own projects and and for whatever reason you know, and sometimes it doesn't line up with public. But but I think overpasses on 3rd Avenue, you know, on Main Street, um, some of those, when the trains are traveling faster, like 17th or 66, you're not sitting there waiting as long. But when they're doing the switching and some of those other issues, it's really a long wait. And I do know that, um, um, I'm trying to think of the engineer, Nick, Nick was always working on trying to get a switching yard north of town, but you know, if we, well, we talk about it, but we never see anything happen. So it's actually, I mean, it's been 10 years in talk, probably, you know, so patience as I'm getting closer to that old age, it's, it's like this stuff takes forever anyway. But so, um, and then the other thing is Longmont's probably the only community that doesn't have four lanes going on 52 and 
66. And of course, everybody pushes it off to another jurisdiction. But I think politically, I don't know, everybody's been repairing bike paths and doing other modes of transportation, whether it be RTD or whatever, and they've just ignored the traveling public. And the traveling public is what we deal with every day. So somehow I, I'm hoping that it's on you guys' radar. And if it's not, if you can give it some thought because it takes so much political will to to get the other counties and state involved. And I know it's probably on the radar, but, but the radar is gonna run out of batteries. So anyway, um, I think that was it. I, I have a lot of respect for you guys. I know it's a monthly meeting and it's, you leave your families at home. My kids were little, you, you come to these meetings and you wonder what you're actually, actually accomplishing but you really are making a difference. So I just hope that you get enough thank yous, you know, for your position. But, but I would say you guys, get, some of these things that they throw at you, in my sense, somebody else is telling them, it's not their idea, but, but if you guys, you guys are running the show, so, so make it your priorities. And, and I think they'll they gladly deal with those. So anyway, thank you. Thank you, Scott. Um, we'll move on to the information items, starting with the transportation operational budget review. Good evening, Chair Lehner and board members. Uh, I'm Jim Angstadt, Director of Engineering Services. Uh, this evening, we wanted to provide you just some quick information. Um, regarding one of the components of our budget um, process. Um, Tom Street and Ariel Ratuta will be talking about the CIP Capital Improvement Program budget for 2023 to 2027 later. I just wanted to give you a quick overview of the operating budget. Um, kind of you can think of it in ways of, of the CIP is kind of what we do. The operating budget gives us the tools to actually do that. Um, kind of a general overall statement, um, but uh, you'll see, kind of see, hopefully, as this unfolds. And I'll try to, it's only a few slides, um, try not to hold up too much. I know there's a, a lot more on the agenda. Um, transportation funding, um, for the most part, comes out of our three-quarter cent sales tax to serve the street fund. We normally, in a year-to-year -year basis, see about $22 million come into that fund, um, mostly through our our street fund sale and sales and use tax. Uh, there's a little state highway use tax, automobile tax, and miscellaneous uh, dollars. Usually miscellaneous is some developer-driven dollars as well as maybe some grants. So that changes from year to year. Um, for our operating budget in streets, in 2023, we're looking at around a $13 million budget. Um, I've broken it out, kind of some major uh, items, administration, engineering, operations, traffic signals, and the transportation system management kind of program. Um, there's also a TSM item in CIP, so I don't want to confuse you with that when Tom speaks about it later. Uh, this is, is basically the, the dollars we use to, to make things kind of go. Um, so what are the budget items? Usually you'll see salaries, insurance, office supplies, safety expenses, uniforms, uh, training and conferences, equipment repair uh, items leases and rentals, telephones, um, materials and supplies, which is very critical and particularly in, in our operations group for items like snow removal. Um, and then we also, uh, a portion of our budget goes into the fleet budget uh, because they are responsible for purchasing of vehicles and then maintaining our vehicles as well. Um, in general administration, there's an item we have in our budget. Um, that's usually mostly salaries for uh, that come out of the street fund for other employees who s help and assist uh, the street fund. It's usually at the director level. Um, we see uh, the, um, who is now the, I want to say the acting uh, or interim deputy city manager, used to be the public works director. He is, is a lot of that is his budget salaries. There's some goes to communications and there's some parcels in land management we also uh, help to fund. <clears throat> 
engineering, this is kind of, I don't like to think it's the brains of the outfit, but uh, Phil may question that statement. Um, transportation engineering, uh, our survey and tech team, construction inspection, we have a team of inspectors uh, who, who serve uh, for our CIP as well as some of our development projects, uh, street improvement and street rehab. Um, those are all coming out of the, that help serve the engineering team uh, for um, our work. Um, and then operations, these are the guys who are actually boots on the ground who do a lot of the field work. Um, street and alley maintenance, uh, street cleaning, uh, snow and ice removal. A large chunk of that is the materials they need to actually, when they are out, um, uh, prior to storms and during storms. Uh, we do some concrete repair and then signing and pavement marking. Uh, there's quite a number of signs in the city. Uh, we have a program uh, that goes through and, and looks for reflectivity in accordance with uh, standards. Um, we replace signs, signs get knocked over. Uh, as well as every year we do in conjunction with some of, on some of our CDOT roads and fronting from CDOT, we do uh, refresh our, a lot of the pavement markings in town. Um, another item that falls under engineering, um, it's kind of between engineering and, and operations is our traffic signals. Uh, we have three staff members uh, that serve that. Um, we also have a lot of contracted services. Uh, we contract with uh, a vendor who is who provides a lot of our maintenance um, with oversight from our staff. Uh, equipment's a big number. Uh, we get a lot of, of uh, every couple of months, one of our signal cabinets gets knocked over. Uh, we keep, uh, basically we keep two spare cabinets year round so that if one's knocked over and damaged, we can replace it almost immediately without loss of service. Um, and utilities, uh, supplies, fleet, and repair and maintenance are other items that we, we include. Um, transportation system management. This is one um, that's a little bit different in our operating because it has a large chunk of it is professional and contracted services. Um, the salaries um, are noted there. Most of those dollars are for our crossing guards. We have a crossing guard program uh, in conjunction with the school district um, that um, we have crossing guards at a number of, of crossings throughout the city during the school year. Uh, they work like an hour in the morning and an hour in the evening. Um, and then our supplies, I noted that uh, because that's what is assisting um, some of our bike programs. Um, we, we buy some uh, bike racks each year, as well as our bike, our bike to work program and printing of bike maps. Um, ben had mentioned earlier EcoPass. Uh, for every city employee, we provide an EcoPass that runs at about $70,000. As indicated, we will see a, a, a rebate for the month of August. Um, some dues and subscriptions uh, for some outside vendors we have as well as, uh, and then going into our professional and contracted services. This is where our transit dollars are. Um, we spend $150,000 to VIA to help support their program. Uh, special event traffic control is for events in town. Uh, we cover those for uh, help with LDEA on the events when we close Main Street or uh, there's a parade. The flex bus coming out of, of Fort Collins is 138000 a year. And then our free ride, which is RTD, and the accessor ride runs over 500000 a year. So this is just some of the dollars we wanted to provide, show you kind of where um, another aspect of kind of what the city does with uh, our tax dollars. With that, I'll open it up to any questions. Jim, what's the source or the sources of the operational budget? Where's the money come from? That comes from the, uh, go back to the first, the, it goes out, it comes into the, out of the street fund, which is, Funded through the three quarter cent sales tax, uh, about 14 million. We get some state highway use tax dollars, um, about 2.8 million. Um, some automobile tax, uh, and then some miscellaneous dollars. Miscellaneous dollars changes year to year depending on, on whether we get grants. That's where uh, we'll see grants. Some of that dollars from this year is, uh, I think we got an HSIP grant, Highway Safety Improvement Program uh, grants, and then uh, some CDOT stuff. 
Thank you. I was wondering, um, the new Colorado delivery fee, will that change this funding next year? Where is that money going? The 27 cents for every delivery, that is such an accounting nightmare. <laughs> Bill says we'll see some of it. Um, I hope so. <laughs> I, we, we, this is, uh, I laid this out from 2022. We have not, um, in our 2023 budget, have programmed that in at all yet. So when we get more information on that, we'll, we can provide you an update. Thank you. Unless you want to tackle it. <laughs> Hi, Jim. Um, thanks for the presentation. Um, I was wondering, I got, I got two questions. Um, how does the $22.1 million compare with uh, last year's budget? And then um, secondly, uh, since since a lot of this comes from the, the three-quarter cent sales tax, um, how does that coincide with the uh, revenue projections for the year? And, and is it going up by the same amounts and, and, and stuff like that? So when we, we, um, we program our budget, what we usually look at is, is a 3 to 5% increase in revenues as there's growth in the city. The three-quarter cent sales tax hasn't changed from when it was originally initiated, I think, in the mid-'80s, I want to say. But we've seen a inc steady increase of that as population grows, as we add, add commercial entities. Um, you'll see that those taxes go up. So we fa they factor that in, and then we track it. So this is a projected budget. Um, this numbers are actually what we saw in 2022. Those numbers would have changed as we saw those revenues come in, and I think Jim Golden uh, the finance director sends out a monthly uh, report uh, that notes the, the the budget and the revenues that have been coming in. So we track that. Usually where our, our 3 or 5% that we note is usually well below what we see. Um, so there's, uh, we're, we're, we're not at a loss later in the year. Did I get both questions? Do you recall about where last year's budget was? Are we, we in the 10%? where inflation is or, or or where do you think we are? So for operating, we, we, we really haven't seen, we don't really get, except for supplies, get hit with a lot of the inflation. The inflation we see is is sort of in our CIP with material costs going through the roof. Mm -hmm. um, but in the operating budget, it hasn't impacted it nearly enough. Uh, and then we always put in a little bit of factor of safety in, in some of our budget. So um, for this year, we usually see about 20 to 22 million coming in in the in revenues um, and then as I indicated you know of, of late we've I think last year we had about a 12 million dollar operating budget next year is going to be 13 so that's what we're seeing some of those increases great if there are no more questions we'll move on to County's US 287 BRT phase one and um, support of recommendation. So they're going to uh, do their presentation on the BRT project and have a question for you uh, for your support at the end. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Kathleen Bracke, who is the director of, and I always forget it. <laughs> Kathleen Bracke, I'm the Deputy Director for Boulder County's Community Planning and Permitting Department and lead our transportation planning team. Um, and with me tonight is Jeff Butts, our transportation planner from Boulder County, and he's the project manager for our US 287 corridor planning. I want to say a great shout out to uh, Phil for all of the work that we get to do together with the City of Longmont and Boulder County. None of the projects we work on together would be possible without these partnerships and all the work that we do side by side working on all of these different projects. And uh, while this evening we're here to talk specifically about the corridor planning for US 287, we work together um, on all of the different corridors and uh, safety and bicycle and pedestrian and transit and the list goes on and on. So I just am very, very thankful for the work and the partnership with Boulder County and the city of Longmont and working with Phil, so thank you. Um, and, and I think that's a good example of, you know, how we got here with the US 287 corridor planning process. Um, this project came about through the Northwest Area Mobility Study that uh, we, our communities all worked on together. 
um, over the years. And it's really been a planning partnership um, with Boulder County, City of Longmont, um, Erie, Lafayette, uh, Broomfield, RTD, and the Colorado Department of Transportation and uh, Commuting Solutions. We do a lot of work together with our local agency partners as well as Commuting Solutions, our Transportation Management Association for this area. Um, but what's also unique about the US 287 process is that we partnered with um, the communities to the north when we look at City of uh, Loveland and City of Fort Collins. Um, and, and there's many reasons for that, but really it comes down to how people travel. People just need to get where they need to go. They don't think about what geographic boundary they're crossing or what jurisdiction or what county they're in uh, for that matter. <laughs> they just wanna get where they need to go. And so this um, multi-agency partnership was really an example of that, of trying to focus on where, where do our customers need to go and how do we work together across our agencies to figure that out. So it's been a lot of great work um, together. We can go to the next slide, Jeff. Great. So um, do you want to take over from here? Or if you want me to, I can give a little bit more background on this. But again, I think many of us know um, what we're facing on 287, the traffic congestion, the uh, safety concerns, and, we're, and our air quality issues. And we know we're facing a growing region. We have more and more people um, traveling along 287 for more trip types and purposes. Um, it was interesting in Boulder County, we just updated our transportation plan back in 2020. And the highest growing area of trips um, between Boulder County it, um, it was Larimer and Weld counties. So yes, there's lots of trips that are continuing between Boulder County and the Denver metro area. The growth area for us is in this area. So I think with that cue, I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff to take it from here. Great, <clears throat> thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, members of the Transportation Advisory Board for having us here. Well, thank you, Phil, for your continued partnership and great ideas and uh, he has a keen eye when it comes to this and a keen, uh, uh, he's always looking out for the community here. So we thank Phil. Building off what Kathleen said, uh, this area is not only growing, but it is expected to grow faster than the entire region at 75% um, versus about 50%. And so with that, we can look at these slides here and we can see that the population is along 287. And when we look at the US 287 transit route, people aren't getting there by car. Fewer than 20% of people are getting there by car. Most people are getting there by transferring from another bus or they're walking or bicycling to it. Uh, as Kathleen mentioned, this came from the Northwest Area Mobility Study, which was another large study done back in 2015. RTD led the charge on and it created a network of routes that you can see on the map that really help people get to and from everywhere that they want to go. And after that, there's been a lot of planning that has happened, including a couple of plans here in Longmont, the downtown plan and then the uh, Main Street plan. So we've, we looked at those and we took those into account. And now we're moving into the uh, bus rapid transit plan. And so talk about, first off, really um, what, our, what was our objective and what we were trying to achieve. And so as Kathleen mentioned, and as we all know, people travel beyond jurisdictions. And that is an important feature of this region. And so we looked at connecting services with transit from Fort Collins into Denver, and then we had a core area where we were looking at transportation, the transit, and then also capital investments in the roadway between Colorado 66 and North Longmont, and then 36 uh, at Broomfield. We had a lot of community engagement, including coming to the t Transportation Advisory Board a while ago. Um, probably have some new, in fact, I know we have some new members now. I spoke with some of them back then, and um, we also talked with technical staff, members of the public, elected officials, and we heard a lot of themes come from the public and from the technical side of things and the elected officials, which you can see here, a lot of it beyond transit. There was safety, there was connectivity, bicycles came up, and so there was a lot more than just the transit on this corridor that people were um, talking about. And so, 
focus right now on the transit and what we did. First thing that we did was we looked at the stations and the state, we developed a stations area toolkit on that's applicable elsewhere and it includes four different areas. It includes intersections around the stations themselves. It includes multimodal connections such as like bicycling, uh, bike parking, long-term bike parking, uh, the stations themselves, uh, making them comfortable, uh, some enclosure, signage, where you wait. There's a whole lot of ideas in, in this. Um, and then finally building up to placemaking and transit-oriented development, which is um, which I'll build to. And this map shows the recommendations. It could be a little bit confusing. It's sort of like a subway map. The, the north is on the left, and so that's where Fort Collins is at. And the real, feat, the real thing I want to highlight here is that there's a long route from Fort Collins into Denver, which is, long, or which is really an express route with limited stops. And then there's the core BRT between North Longmont and Broomfield 36 Station. And then there is the shorter one between Lafayette and Broomfield. There's a hospital there, and so there's excess demand. And these layer on top of each other to get, uh, you're looking about 15, 10 minute intervals is what we were um, looking at for this area. And then we looked at different capital investments. So we had an idea of what the, the routes are. And this, this is where the demand is at for the routes, but what about the capital? First thing was do nothing at all. Next thing we could do is operational improvements and do nothing but operational modifications. And then after that, we look at the stations and look at the intersections. And then finally, bus or the bus and turning lanes or bat lanes, uh, business access and transit. Uh, did, this is not. These were modeled scenarios. It's not necessarily an implementation plan. So Longmont may want to go with bat lanes prior to doing intersections. Or These were the modeled. And so to walk you through the data here, we looked at the morning, we looked at the night, we looked at the northbound and southbound directions here, and then we found the baseline travel time for the bus, and then we found that we could significantly reduce the travel time by optimizing the, um, the operations of, of the route itself. And then once we get into capital investments, we see that we are able to reduce the travel time even more and more. And with that, we see increased ridership. Um, for the operations side of things, we're looking at just under 4,000 is what was modeled. To give you an idea of scale, that's just under triple what there is right now. And then as soon as we get up into capital investments, the bus starts going even faster and it, it becomes more competitive form of transit transportation for people to use. And so we see more people using it. Looking at the different routes within here, uh, that blue again is the long route from Fort Collins to Denver. The red in the middle is the core BRT between Longmont and Broomfield, and then you can see the Lafayette to Broomfield portion at the bottom there. The largest section of ridership is really coming from uh, that express service into Denver that drives a lot of the ridership, which I'm sure you're all aware of. That's a lot of people going there. Looking at the costs here, if, when we do the operational costs, that's uh, changes there's no capital expenditures and so that's operations and maintenance only and then we get into scenario one which again was stations and intersection uh, improvements and we're looking around 180 to 200 million in 21 do in 2021 dollars and then uh, scenario three where we do the stations the intersections and then include the bus and turning lanes uh, bat lanes we're looking 215 to 230 is the estimate there an important thing to call out here, this is the operations that I put below here. And the reason I put it below here is because it shows that as we make one-time investments in capital, it reduces the ongoing operations. That means we have to have fewer buses, fewer drivers, um, fewer, fewer hours of service paid out. Um, looking at the next steps, as I mentioned at the top, uh, we 
uh, continuing to move along? We're going to be opportunistic, looking at multiple different opportunities to uh, implement this. So there could be some going in in Longmont, some going in in Boulder County, some in different areas as opposed to rebuilding the whole highway at once. So it'll be a phased approach. And, and try to meet multiple objectives. Like well, we met up top safety that came up huge and bicycling came up huge. It was just consistently talked about so much so that it's led to a phase two that we didn't know was going to happen when we started what's now phase one, the BRT feasibility study. And phase two is vision zero safety and multimodal mobility. So how do we reduce crashes looking from on US 287 from um, the county line to US 36. Uh, we're going to have funding partners, of course. Longmont uh, is part of it. So uh, thank you, City of Longmont, uh, for your continued partnership. The emphasis, of course, will be on safety for people, uh, and whether they're driving, walking, bicycling, getting to or from the stations. Uh, and then uh, we'll be following a federal planning process. That way we get ourselves set up for those uh, federal dollars. and. The recommendations from this study will feed into that next study. And so we'll look for overlapping projects where we can find some win-win. So that's the overview that we have. If you want to go to the website, it's boco.org slash 287 planning. If you want to stay up to date, uh, boco.org slash 287 news. And with that, open it up for discussion. And Phil, I believe you said this was an action item where we're asking for uh, support to continue on this process for towards uh, federal funding. I forget how you wrote it, Phil. Yeah, the recommendation, the staff recommendation is listed in your packet. It's listed as um, provide general support to the 287 BRT phase one plan and support the continuing planning work needed to bring federal dollars to this corridor. And so I'm happy to take any questions. I have a couple. Um, kind of a question on the BRT um, and how we're going to be able to decrease, I should say increase safety with um, the traveling public not really being familiar with BRT kind of protocols and methodology with the buses. Is there going to be a fairly long-term, let's say, education plan for the commuters? Because you're still going to have, obviously, cars on this corridor. Um, and as we all know, <laughs> some of them are going to speed up and do other things to try to get in front of a bus when even a bus has a dedicated lane and or these, these bad lanes. I was just curious if you guys have done either any modeling on that or uh, has there been past studies on this to kind of talk about the, the safety value on, on that? Thank you for the question on travel behavior, I believe, and how do we educate the public. And this is exactly why we're here, is to hear from you and to listen from you. And that was that will be an important part when we get into implementation. And that will be something that I think everybody will need to work on together uh, and individually. So that's, that's, that's a really important point that you bring up. Thank you for bringing that up. And, and then the last other question that I had was in regards to, I saw the termination down in Broomfield um, and, and obviously points along. Um, has there been talk about last mile providers as it relates to, again, coming from, let's say you're, you're at a station, let's say uh, in Longmont, um, and you either electronic scooter, electronic bike, uh, we Phil, we or and David, we've talked about the um, having Uber drop off, those sorts of things. Is that also something that's part of this plan? Again, great question. And you're thinking along the lines of where we are and the questions that came up as we moved along. And the one thing that we did in this plan was we developed that stations area toolkit that looked at the safety between getting to and from the stations themselves and the intersections, because the intersections is where it's really important for predictability. Um, as far as uh, the, the rest of your question, uh, we're moving that into the phase two study. And so that's gonna really highlight safety 
for all users. And that's going to highlight as well those connections uh, into the stations and into different areas where people may go, including bikeway connections, trails were mentioned earlier. So well, those are things that came out of this study that we've learned that we need to look at more. Well, that's what we've heard from from multiple people. So thank you for your question. Chair, thank you, Chair. Or ex-chair, or your chair now. Is, any other questions from the board? OK, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. There's an action item. <laughs> There's an action item, Phil. Oh, if, if the board would so entertain the, um, the staff recommendation to, again, that's to provide general support to US-287 BRT phase one plan and support the continuing planning work needed to bring federal dollars to this corridor. So um, you can or you don't have to, but if, um, that would We be should ask question. for a motion, I, I suppose. And a second. move that we provide support for continued study on this. I will second that motion. Great. All those in favor, raise your hand. Okay, we'll move to uh, comments from board members. We'll start down. Oh, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead. I apologize. Oh, the CIP. Chairperson Lehner, members of TAB. My name is Tom Street and I work within the Public Works and Natural Resources Department, and tonight I'm here with Ariel Rituda, and we're here to present the city's proposed 2023 to 2027 CIP as it relates to transportation projects. As far as tonight's uh, format, um, we're going to start off with some background information on the city's CIP process. We'll move into presentation of the projects. And then at the end of tonight's presentation, we're going to be asking TAB for a recommendation. There's going to be two options. Option one would be a recommendation of the CIP as presented by staff. Option two would be recommendation of the CIP as presented by staff, but with revisions as recommended by the TAB. As far as the city's CIP process, uh, first and foremost, our CIP is a planning document. It identifies the city's capital infrastructure needs over the next five years. A capital project can be different types. We could have a new project. We could have a project that replaces existing infrastructure. And we can have a project that uh, modifies existing facilities. Our CIP identifies met and unmet needs in that uh, projects are grouped as funded partially funded or unfunded. And uh, it's important to note that our CIP is a dynamic document. It changes each year in response to changing citywide priorities, changing funding levels. One other item to note is that even though our CIP is a five-year planning document, the expenditures, the budget is only approved one year at a time. So when City Council meets this October to approve budgets, to approve our CIP budget, only the 2023 expenditures will be approved at that point. Staff uses a variety of information to determine which projects go into the CIP. At the highest level is Envision Longmont. Uh, this document has uh, dedicated sections 
you know, for transit needs, roadway improvements, uh, pedestrian bike needs. Um, at the next level, staff will use a variety of master plans and studies, such as the 2014 Longmont Roadway Plan. This plan identifies the various arterial and intersection needs throughout Longmont. We also use asset management plans on a regular basis. We have a five-year pavement management plan that identifies pavement rehabilitation and pavement preservation needs for the next five years. We also have detailed bridge inspection reports we receive every two years. And these reports help guide our improvements needed for our bridge, bridges within town. And of course, funding is always a, a constraint when selecting projects. As Jim mentioned, uh, we have uh, our most critical funding source in the city is our three quarter cent street fund sales and use tax. And we, are, we have two funds in Longmont that are dedicated to transportation needs. We have our street fund and TCIF, our transportation community investment fee. The street fund was originally set up in 1986 and it was set up to maintain and improve Longmont's street system. At that time, it required renewal by the voters every five years. And through the years, it had been extended six times until 2019 when this tax was extended permanently. Our TCIF, Transportation Community Investment Fee, this is a, a fee that per our municipal code can only be used on arterial street and intersection improvements. And this fee is levied on new construction and these fees are collected when building permits are issued. But again, when it comes to the most critical revenue funding source for transportation in Longmont, it's the three quarter cent street fund sales and use tax. In 2023, we have a variety of projects. We have asset management projects. We got projects that uh, will improve our intersections. We have roadway capacity projects. We have bridge improvement projects. Uh, we have many different types of multimodal projects. We got projects that will improve our sidewalk systems, our multi-use paths. We got projects that will improve our bicycle infrastructure. We also have projects that uh, will construct pedestrian underpass improvements. Uh, as far as the total appropriation needed in 2023 for these projects from the street fund, it's coming in at about 21.6 million. And tonight, staff will be presenting information on these projects. Our first project we wanted to talk about is TRP001, our pavement management program. Each year within this program, there are five, six, maybe seven different projects. This is a citywide asset management pr project program. It's a program where we contract all out all of the construction needs, all of the construction services, and projects can range from concrete repair, concrete rehabilitation, to pavement preservation needs such as crack sealing and chip sealing. And to the lower right, uh, we have some of our goals for this program. We wanna optimize city resources in a fashion that meets our needs and the lowest long-term cost. We wanna make data-driven decisions. We use automated data collection methods to collect our pavement data. We use pavement management software to help guide the selection of pavement projects within this program. And one of the most important goals for staff is to build credibility as good stewards of public, public resources. Asset management uh, truly is a cornerstone responsibility for staff. We have over 355 centerline miles of roadway in Longmont and uh, the lion's share of maintenance and rehabilitation for our entire street system, our entire transportation system is completed within this program. TRP 11, our transportation system management program. Again, this is another yearly program. And within this program, we design and construct a variety of improvements. We have improvements that will improve safety. We have multimodal improvements. We, we may install traffic signals with this program, alternative mode projects, uh, intersection projects, 
projects that would uh, improve high accident locations. So a lot of different type of work and projects is completed within this, within this program. In 2023, we plan to move forward with our Sunset Street and State Highway 119 project. This project has two primary components. We have an intersection component, and we also have a road diet that will be uh, implemented on Sunset Street from Kansas Avenue up to Nelson Road. Also in 2023, we have two uh, alternate mode projects on County Line Road. The first project on County Line Road will be from 17th Avenue up to State Highway 66. We plan on widening County Line Road to accommodate on-street bike lanes in each direction. And currently we expect that uh, we'll be in the design process for this project for all of 2023. Our second project on County Line Road will be a, a similar project. It'll make improvements to County Line Road from Slayton Drive to the St. Vrain Creek to accommodate on-street bike lanes in each direction. And we expect this project will go to construction in 2023. TRP 92, our Boston Avenue connection project. This is a project that's located at uh, Boston Avenue and Price Road. This project will provide a new east-west arterial connection within the city. This project will not only improve connectivity for vehicles, it'll also improve connectivity for peds and bikes. This project uh, will support BRT as Boston Avenue is a, a preferred route that will provide connectivity to the future transit station at First Avenue and Main Street. Probably the most critical aspect of this project is the coordination that is needed with the Colorado Public Utilities Commission and the Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad. In order for this project to move towards construction, we need to have approval from the Colorado PUC uh, for the proposed the new at-grade crossing with the, with the railroad tracks. Current status is uh, uh, we're in the design process in 2023, we expect to wrap up the design process and uh, acquire all needed right away, which would clear this project to go to construction, assuming we have PUC approval in 2024. One of the goals of Envision Longmont is the, is the need to identify missing sidewalk segments throughout uh, the city and to fill those gaps. Uh, TRP is one of our projects that will help fulfill that goal. Uh, this project will design and construct gaps in our sidewalk system, but also this project will rehabilitate and reconstruct existing sidewalks throughout Longmont. In 2023, our focus is going to be on the relatively large 17th Avenue sidewalk reconstruction effort. This project will uh, replace the deteriorating asphalt sidewalk along the north side of 17th Avenue from Cook Court to near Lincoln Street. Uh, currently, this project, uh, the design has been completed. We've made significant progress on the acquisition of right-of-way needed for this project. And in 2023, we expect to go to construction. At this point, uh, unless there's questions, I'm going to hand it over to Ario Rituda. Thank you, Tom. Um, I'm Ariel Rituda. I'm a civil engineer that works in uh, Tom's group. Let's see. So moving right along, we have TRP 122 Hover Street improvements. Um, this project came straight from the top priority list cited in the Longmont Roadway Plan, which was delivered in 2014. Um, the chief goal of this project is to expand vehicular capacity of Hover Street. That would be from Ken Pratt Boulevard up to Boston Avenue through road widening and adding both travel and designated turning lanes wherever possible. Um, I'll note that this is a corridor that contains two of the highest crash rate locations for signalized intersections, um, which is why it was prioritized so heavily in the planning document. Um, in addition to easing traffic 
um, part of the design is also expanding bicycle, pedestrian, and public transit facilities along this corridor while making safer those that are already existing through uh, slight modification. So over the last few years, the entire corridor has been under design um, in one single design effort. However, construction is to be divided into three different phases um, and constructed as uh, funding becomes available within the city. So um, as prioritized with staff consensus, phase two, which is the Nelson Road and Hover Street intersection, pictured in this rather busy figure that I've included. Um, but here you can kind of see where we're planning to add travel lanes, turning lanes, and um, increase ADA accessibility and pedestrian um, facilities. This project was broken out into uh, a new CIP project, which is listed in your, in your handout, TRP 124. Right now we are undergoing right-of-way acquisition um, and negotiations with Boulder County. Um, we are planning to take that 90% design effort through the finish line, and then we are hoping to construct this phase in 2025. TRP 132 is our Enhanced Multi-Use Corridor, or EMUC, plan. Um, the EMUC plan, which was finalized and delivered in 2018, uh, proposed designs for each of the selected EMUCs at a higher planning level. Um, considerations for design included buffered bike lanes, detached sidewalks, and modifying roadway lanes to mitigate traffic wherever possible, um, depending on existing and projected traffic loading in these areas. Um, two areas that were identified to most improve connectivity to um, key destinations such as parks, trails, schools, and the like um, shook out as 21st Avenue and Mountain View Avenue, um, both roads spanning from Francis Street all the way to Main Street to the east. So design for 21st Avenue is slated to start next year in 2023 with construction in 25. Following that, Mountain View Avenue design um, which is, there's a slight error in my slide, apologies, is slated for 2025 with a construction goal tentatively in 26. The Main Street Corridor Plan, which has been cited a couple times tonight, um, this plan, similar to the EMUC plan, provided preliminary engineering or conceptual high-level planning for a five-mile stretch along Main Street um, from Highway 66 capping the north to Plateau Road capping the south, that's shown here on the left. Um, the plan's objective is to highlight transportation needs centered on safety, mobility, connectivity, and, and, and access. Um, in general, this meant throughout the in entire corridor identifying optimal locations for median and mid-block crossings, um, as well as sidewalk connections and bicycle infrastructure um, where possible. So North Main and Midtown, the two northern areas highlighted in red, um, are slated for further evaluation to help inform actual design efforts. Um, part of this design is a pedestrian underpass at 21st Avenue. Um, that is on the docket for 2023. And along with that, we're hoping to in incorporate a coordinated wayfinding effort as well as traffic signal modifications throughout um, those are also in the pipeline. And I will mention that the spirit of this effort is shared and connected by the previous project, uh, TRP 132 EMUC project, providing this grade separated crossing under Main Street at 21st Avenue and then also progressing the EMUC that will be on Mountain View um, to Main Street and through the intersection progressing to the east. So this is a, a new one, TRP 138 uh, Pace Street Retaining Wall Reconstruction. This project came to us um, by the patrons of the Ute Creek Golf Course and the golf course staff um, reported a failing wing wall adjacent to the underpass located on 17, excuse me, Pace Street between 17th Avenue and Windermere Circle. Um, this is nearly identical to an underpass wing wall failure that we saw um, 
which was designed and reconstructed reconstructed in 2018. Um, it is currently posing a safety hazard to the public, so we have already designed uh, the reconstruction to this wall, and uh, we are hoping to construct it in 2023. Part of this design includes uh, an underdrain system to avoid drainage loading behind the walls, layered reinforcement within the walls, which is currently not present as shown in the picture, um, and sidewalk improvements to the east side of Pay Street uh, while we're there. Um, in the interim, we had our, uh, our operations staff um, temporarily secure the wall so it is not currently posing a safety hazard. Uh, so rest assured. Um, so yeah, 2023, we're hoping to uh, construct this one. Spring Gulch number two, Greenway. Um, this would be phase three, which is pictured in color above in the slide. Um, this is the last leg of uh, an over two and a half mile Greenway trail system, which will complete a north-south connection starting at Ute Creek Golf Course to um, Union Reservoir and then eventually under 119 connecting with the Sandstone Ranch nature area, eventually to connect with the St. Vrain Greenway Trail Phase 13, which is currently under design. Much like phase two, which is now complete, uh, phase three incorporates uh, drainage improvements and a pedestrian underpass under the Great Western Railroad. I'll echo um, Tom's words about coordination with the Public Utility Commission and the railroad to notoriously um, schedule busting entities. Um, this project, um, the construction of this project will be contingent on negotiations and approval by these two entities, specifically the PUC. Um, design is well underway. If everything goes smoothly, we are hoping to commence construction in spring of 2023 to finish off the Spring Gulch number two Greenway project. Last but not least, we have PBF 192 operations and maintenance building site improvements. Um, this project addresses the final phase of the City of Longmont Public Works Campus Master Plan, which was produced back in 2023. Um, you can see what was completed part of this plan in gray, and then what is proposed is shown in green in the triangular figure. Um, these new installments will house equipment, personnel, and materials that support significant street and transportation operations and maintenance activities throughout the year. So for this reason, the transportation fund uh, has a seat at that table, um, about 30%, 35% of a seat at that table for this budget for both design and construction. Um, phase four of this plan, which is the last phase, includes general paving, uh, drainage improvements on the site, the construction of a drying bed, vehicle wash bay, uh, material bunker storage building, and uh, also a vehicle and equipment storage building. So design for this phase is um, anticipated in 2023 with construction tentatively in 2024. So that concludes our presentations on all of those CIP projects. Um, I will open up the floor to any questions. Thank you, that was really fascinating and I enjoy it. Thank you for all the work you did. The question I have was about TRP 137, the Main Street improvements, especially Midtown and North. Um, when we were looking at the information for the BRT plan from the previous presenters, um, I noticed that there's a lot of changes that they'll be doing to the turn lanes and some of the things we looked like we had just done recently. Is there coordination between both groups to make sure we're not making changes now that have to be undone to do that or vice versa? Yeah, there's definitely uh, a, a lot of coordination going on between the two efforts. Uh, I, I believe Phil would probably be able to expand upon the uh, 
type and amount of coordination that is happening, but uh, yeah, definitely the the different groups involved with the different projects are talking on a regular basis. So I think it's important to note, um, I'm sorry, um, <laughs> Board Member Osborne, uh, Chair Lanier. Um, it's important to note that um, the Main Street Corridor Plan is um, really doesn't adjust a lot of the, the areas between the curbs on Main Street. Uh, it focuses a lot on, on other components of the transportation system, trying to move, trying to do some improvements, Im improve landscaping, Im improve bicycle and, and ped connectivity to start driving some of the development um, on that, those areas of Main Street. What we're, we're tying it to mostly is we're starting to see a lot more development or redevelopment along the corridor. So as part of the development review process, we are requiring developers to uh, add improvements um, from the curb line to their building uh, that is in accordance with the Main Street Corridor Plan. But as the BRT plan unfolds, we'll be coordinating with them um, and try not to, there, there shouldn't be too many conflicting uh, items that are, that are going on within the, like the curb to curb area of the roadway. Well, I, I'll just carry on to that because it, the BRT plan really does not do much north of 9th Avenue in Longmont on 287 for either the 119 or the 287 corridor. What we are looking at is at, at the intersection some signal timing improvements that would help with the bus operation. We're also looking at some bike ped improvements, again, beyond the curb line uh, or outside that curb line, but still within our right of way. But they're all working together with these different um, opportunities to move forward. As you'll see at the 21st Avenue underpass design, that's one of the TIP projects that we brought forward to you and it's looking very promising as, as receiving funding. So that will be incorporated with the, the planning piece, but then the engineers will take that over as the design piece and work it into that piece as, as it moves from planning to implementation. Thank you. What I would think I noted, that answered a lot. What I think I noticed that was concerning to me was the previous slide, previous group was showing us information and in their packet there was information that indicated some uh, bus lanes um, right there at 17th Avenue. And I don't know how that's going to work, especially with all the things that were just done to upgrade 17th Avenue. That's a great point. And the idea would be that you could probably have the bus use the turn lane to carry through uh, those intersections, but just at the intersection. So we could do a bus bypass piece, but that's still very preliminary in nature. We don't have that designed uh, at this point. It is something that the county included in their planning process. We're gonna certainly try to implement as much as we can, but uh, the reality is some of that may not show up and not be feasible. That addresses what I was thinking, not be feasible. That intersection is a nasty intersection to begin with. And trying to imagine a uh, bus pass lane, I'm, I do the southbound left turn from Maine to 17th daily. And I can't imagine a bus pass lane happening there at all. And so I, I, I guess I just want to make sure that everybody is aware of what can and can't be done without taking more land, I think. Thank you. Hi, um, thanks for the presentation. Um, my question was about the pavement management program, it's CRP001. Um, <clears throat> and maybe I missed it um, during the presentation, but it, it is a large chunk of money, the $8.2 million, I believe, is what's made for this. Can you just go over some of the major areas of the city that that $8.2 million is going to hit? It's a citywide program. Mm -hmm. And again, the project selection is based on the pavement data we receive, use of our pavement management software, along with staff judgment. At this point tonight, I don't have the list of streets that are being proposed for 2023. But typically speaking, you know, they're spread throughout the city, and there's typically a good balance between local residential collector and arterial type roadways. Okay. 
Um, my question is TRP 122, the Hover Street. Um, my, well, I have two questions. My, my main thing is wondering, are there going to be ped, uh, pedestrian underpasses uh, planned to make that safer for a separation? Or, you know, and then, uh, and then secondly, I was wondering, because I, I'm feeling like adding widening three lanes uh, d just doesn't follow. I don't know if you're familiar with the down Thompson paradox. Uh, you know, improvements in the road network will not reduce congestion if improvements make public transit uh, less uh, convenient. So, so I'm just wondering if we're going to try to improve congestion, shouldn't, should we focus on just a public transit network? Uh, that's, that, that's my concern. So. I'll take a shot at it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I appreciate that. The, the The idea with Hover is really that that's the primary corridor for our bus rapid transit from 119. Mm -hmm. So you saw a previous slide of Boston Avenue crossing the railroad tracks just north of the um, St. Frank Greenway, uh, closer to downtown. This is actually the segment to the west where on Nelson we have a BRT that comes up airport, north on airport, then east on Nelson and then north at Hover right here. And then we have the 119 portion of the corridor that comes up 119, a separate bus route, that comes up 119 at Hover, turns north on Hover, and then it uses Boston Avenue to get across to the first and main station. The other bus will go kind of on the west side of town and then mm -hmm. uh, jog over on 17th and go north up to 66 on Main Street. So that one kind of serves the whole west side of town for bus rapid transit. Uh, it'll be especially effective in the more commuting times. And then this other bus uh, is meant to go down Boston and use that crossing. So the widening does actually enhance what's happening with buses as well in this corridor. What may be a potential is that we could provide more um, you know, bus only operation or bus operation for that third lane in each direction. But right now we're just, it's been designed as a through movement for all vehicles, but it does help the bus. I'm, you know, my, my point is if we just make it easier for a car, then who's going to take the bus rapid transit? So. Thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Street and uh, Ms. Rotuda for your presentation. Very informative. Um, I'll start off with a question for you, Mr. Street. I was looking through the, the project sheets that were included in our packet, and some of them were puzzling to me. For example, PBF080, which is titled Municipal Building Boiler Replacement, a sum of next year's funding for boilers would come from a source identified as fleet. So what is fleet and what does it have to do with boiler replacement? Good question. I think, uh, I think this question is really related to PVF 192 that Ariel spoke about. And it, it, it's really related to our financial policies. And when we have a building, a facility, that needs improvement, that needs modifications. It's up to that service that's within that facility to pay their fair share. So my assumption on that particular uh, CIP sheet that fleet has skin in the game and they need to pay their fair share. And the intent, to be honest with you, wasn't really to you know point out fleet's uh, responsibility in that project it was really meant to show the street funds responsibility for that facility for that project a lot of times people ask well why is the street fund paying for boilers why is the street fund paying for a new roof and and that's the reason why okay uh, <clears throat> in other projects i won't go into the details of the project numbers and so forth i noticed that um fleet 
funding and also street funding, which I assumed refers to the sales tax revenue, were also being uh, appropriated for flooring replacement and uh, HVAC replacement and so forth. And some of the buildings listed, I, I was really hard pressed to make any connection to transportation. Yeah, you know, again, it, it goes back to those facilities that uh, they have a street or transportation service housed out of that building or that facility and the street fund needs to pay for that portion of those improvements. So, you know, it could be it could be replacing the carpet, it could be replacing a roof, it could be modifying that structure. So all of these projects are related, but we really wanted to have full disclosure and make sure it was apparent that street fund funding is going towards some of those efforts. Mm -hmm. And to the best of your knowledge, have um the revenues generated by the street improvements tax been appropriated for these projects that are seem to be tenuously related to transportation ever since the money started to be collected in probably 1987? Or is that something that's happened more recently? Uh, to be honest with you, I can't attest that uh, it, it's been uh, this approach from day one, from 1986. I, I can attest that over the last five or ten years, this has been consistent with city policy. Okay, thank you. Um, I noticed that the project justification for the Kaufman Street busway improvements indicates that Center running bus lanes are the fastest and most efficient facility for buses. Are center running lanes proposed for Kaufman? No, they are not. Uh, what what happened was there was a reevaluation of the whole corridor. That was the original scope of the project. That center running lane center running lanes were considered the best for bus rapid transit. Uh, that was in more like corridors like. Colfax in Denver, um, also along US 36 in between Boulder and Denver. It did not apply for Kaufman Street, so it was considered the standard, the gold standard. But with Kaufman Street, we took a reevaluation of a two lane road with a center turning lane and parking. It was a completely different type of facility, so it did warrant that we do the outside lanes because there were stops along that outside mm -hmm. lane too. We weren't gonna put stops in the middle and then try to have people cross the street in there. So. Right, that was my recollection that um, the preferred alternative was side running, but I was puzzled to see that. Yeah, those, the, uh, those CIP projects, once you get the uh, scope in there for the very first one, regardless, it seems to just, unless we go through and do a really, my, my job is to edit those down better and I didn't, I, I didn't, look at that one specifically, but that one was probably one that we could have, we could have changed, but it does stay, you know, once you put it in, it stays that way throughout its, its history. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna move along to Nelson Road and Hover. And uh, this is kind of a follow up to the comment earlier about pedestrian underpasses. So I'll ask you, Ms. Rotuda, explain to us how you, um, believe that expanding an intersection to eight lanes enhances the pedestrian experience. I'll say that um, I myself was not part of this design effort. I'm uh, moving it along as we had some staff move away from our group. So I'm going to own a friend and turn it over to, to Tom. <laughs> uh, difficult question, and, and you're right. When you add laneage, you know, there's always trade-offs, but will I, what I will note on this project is that uh, it has taken a balanced approach as far as trying to incorporate transit needs, on-street bike lane needs, vehicular needs, we're trying to promote, you know, the um, 
best balance for all modes of transportation. But to be honest with you, there is some trade-off. Okay, so pedestrians will be allowed to cross Hover at that intersection. Is that correct? That is correct. It's yeah. a signalized intersection. And so it'll uh, be demand actuated pedestrian signals? Correct. So how much time do you have to allocate for a pedestrian to cross eight lanes? Uh, I'm, I'm looking all the way in the back to Caroline. Uh, how, how many feet per second? It, it, it's a significant amount of time. Obviously, going from two lanes to four lanes to six lanes to eight lane, it, it takes additional time. And there is an impact on capacity at that point. Right. That was going to be my next question. Would you, would you disagree if I said that having to put in a pedestrian crossing time for eight lanes significantly reduces any capacity improvements that would otherwise entail uh, for cycles that include a pedestrian in the intersection? There certainly will be an impact, but again, it's gonna be based on the actual demand for pedestrian movement across that intersection. So my next just, question is, can I just uh, add to go that ahead. just real, real quick, Mr. sorry. Um, we've also spent a significant, significant amount of resources on a pedestrian underpass just south of this location. So we really are trying to work people to move closer to that Bentway it's just south of Bentway, mm -hmm. uh, that crossing as well. So that a lot of effort was put into that underpass a number of years ago to get that built uh, to help alleviate some of these issues that you're seeing at the intersection here at Hover and Nelson. So um, I won't say that there's anything close, very close north of this, but we are planning a new signal uh, north with the new development near Home Depot that will also facilitate pedestrians across this roadway. So we've got a couple opportunities, but I don't think that's the exact answer you're looking for, but it does help with underpasses for Hover. And you would use <clears throat> some kind of signing to try to direct people to the underpass? That's part of the whole bus rapid transit program is to do a wayfinding program to get people both to the different transit um, stops. And there is one just north of Nelson on Hover planned. So a transit stop there would be a, critical and they're um, not only that but to get people over or in this case under Hover Street uh, just south of this location and basically point people to the safest crossing point as well and the different the different new facilities that we'll have out here for bicycle and pedestrians we won't have the on street on Hover obviously that's going to be mostly uh, anything for bicycles and pedestrians will be um, beyond the curb I should say, or within the, yeah, within that curb, curb piece outside of the lanes of traffic. The on-street piece is the Nelson section, so there's mm -hmm. on-street there. But it is about getting all these different, and we talked about this, I think, a little earlier, about how do you get all these kind of micro-mobility pieces and the, and, and, the, and the last first and last mile pieces to the bus rapid transit corridor. So it's, it's all a system along this whole corridor, and this is one aspect. Okay, thank you. That sounds like a, a good approach. And uh, finally, um, I'll turn to BRT on Boston Avenue. Now, did I hear correctly that the extension of Boston Avenue will utilize uh, an, an at-grade railroad crossing? That is the current proposal. Okay, and my follow-up question is, isn't it somewhat antithetical to put bus rapid transit uh, over an at-grade railroad crossing, considering that the roadway traffic always has to stop for a train? I will answer that one as well, because <laughs> I can feel the heat coming from these guys. Um, there, is a, there is an issue, obviously. There's a couple issues, actually. By locating first in Maine where we did, we do have to cross the railroad twice. Uh, we do have South Pratt Parkway, the overpass, Scott Nix will remember this one um, <laughs> and the issues with that. Uh, that overpass does provide the relief that we need. So we can have buses. It's a, it's a little longer way to go, but it is going uh, Boston to Price Road if there's a train block blocking 
and then use the, Pratt, the South Pratt Parkway overpass to get around that. But we, we were pushed quite hard by the folks who were doing the marketing and the, and the, and the redevelopment is to really put that station where we planned it on that south east, southwest corner of First and Main Street. That tucks us into that corner of being surrounded by railroad tracks. So you're correct. And we've looked at the idea of how do you do underpasses for Main Street under the railroad tracks and how do you do uh, underpasses for Boston underneath the railroad tracks. And they're both, um, they're just so expensive and they basically take away all the access for the businesses nearby because of the amount of space that you need. So we've we've looked at those through the years. I'd say that every five or so years, we get another request for Main Street underneath the railroad tracks and we look at it again, cost it out and, and figure out what the impacts are. But um, those are both tough intersections and we're gonna have to live with kind of what's happened with all this uh, historical um, consequence for our, for where we need to put these things for redevelopment purposes and for the bus purposes. Got it, thank you. That's all for me. Um, I've got one question, but a comment. Uh, first off, thanks for all the information. Very comprehensive, thank you. And thank you board members for all the questions and the and comments as well. Um, Hover, I was just curious, um, as we're talking about the widening um, and with the redevelopment of Twin, Twin Peaks Mall, I've noticed there's a lot more ped traffic that goes across, uh, almost mid, you know, mid between Nelson and, and Dent Way. Ped overpass, that's pretty common. I know Littleton, they did that quite extensively to a remodeled uh, shopping mall. They put ped overpasses, I think, you know, Wadsworth and I can't remember the, the other streets. So I'm just curious if there's been other alternatives to alleviate some of the Head issues that would happen at the signalized intersections to be able to allow them the ability to get over to, you know, let's say you, you want to get over to Whole Foods, right? But you parked over by, I don't know, Wahoo's Fish Tacos, right? So I was just curious if that was anything that was even looked at in terms of a plan. Oh, I see some nodding. I think it goes back to Phil's earlier comment as far as the Dry Creek pedestrian underpass that was designed and constructed several years ago. It's just south of Bent Way, and I think it provides a lot of the benefit and fulfills a lot of the need that you're talking about with a, a possible overpass at that location. And I'll just add that none of those things are in our current comprehensive or envisioned Longmont plan at this time. Certainly as we come back to this group, we'll wanna talk about how we get those different items, those different projects into our plan, uh, if those are things that we need to start looking at and uh, evaluating. Yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate what we've done with the underpass. However, how many folks that are shopping in either those spots, you know, on Hover know that there is a pedestrian underpass that's south of that way. So I, I realize that some of this is, you know, the onus is on the city to communicate this and, and let, let folks know about that. But let's face it, I mean, in the day-to-day, -day, we know that not everybody's gonna see that or, or, or know that. So just, just a comment about that. Thank you. And I think we, you gave us two options. That is correct. Um, first option would be a recommendation of the CIP as presented by staff. Option two would be recommendation of the CIP as presented by staff, but with uh, revisions as recommended by the board. I guess I'm open to how, how would we tackle this in regards to the second option? What revisions from the board does anybody see that they would want to, I guess, discuss further? So I think maybe what we should do then is um, get a motion to move to option one as an approval. Does that sound like it's the right course? I move that we approve the CIP plan as presented by staff. I'll second. 
All those in favor, raise your hand. Okay, um, I think we've wrapped up the action items and we have um, comments from the board members. I'll start down with the vice chairperson, Osborne. Um, I just want to thank everyone that worked so very hard to present information to us tonight. Um, we value the time, or I should say I value the time that you, you put in and and it was it was very informative and it explained a lot of things. Um, I want to thank uh, Mr. Nix for speaking, giving us some historical background on some things that I hadn't realized. And I really appreciate the work that he has done in the past and his willingness to come here and tell us what is important in his eyes and the people he speaks to because we don't get a lot of feedback from the community and, the, and I really value you coming here tonight. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I'd like to thank everybody. Uh, like Mix, Mr. Nick said, everyone um, taking time away from their families on a Monday night um, isn't the easiest to, thing to do, especially uh, public servants like yourselves um, that come here. And, and so thank you for preparing all this and, and giving um, giving your presentations um, for us. Um, I, I really do appreciate it. Um, that being said, I don't know if I, I get in trouble for this, but um, I d there were a couple things that, you know, I, I would, is it appropriate that I could ask staff to, to address Mr. Nix's comments or, or um, I counted four on, on here about, um, I don't know if you, you kept notes or anything, but. Um, well, I have. I think that's okay. Well, we took yeah. the, we took the note, we took the note, um, Chair and Member, uh, to Brugger. We took the notes that well, there's no paint at the eco cycle or the striping of the parking lanes and so that needs to be addressed. So we'll, we'll move that forward. Um, for the Third Avenue striping, I think we heard that there was, um, and maybe maybe Jim has a better idea of, of kind of what's happening here, but the um, for eastbound bike path versus lane, are we really talking about, there's been a very big push lately and I think a lot of you have heard this from us before, is that the bike paths are wonderful, and they do a great job. There's one on the north side of 3rd Avenue in this location where Mr. Nix was talking about. Uh, it, it does a good job of carrying two-way traffic for the most part, but it's a little narrower than we would build today. So we do have issues when there's people walking, dogs, strollers, or even bicycling on that. And that's really for the lower stress bicycle uh, folks. So we are building lanes in a lot of these locations where we already have side paths that seem to be adequate for all bicycle users, but, but we're finding out that that's not the case. So we're seeing that there's a lot more need and a lot more desire for the people who are more, much more confident bicycling to have a bicycle lane on street because they're gonna use the street anyway is what we're finding out. And so we're trying to provide that space to be safe. And so we're putting the new standard is to do the, the buffered bike lanes. And so we're seeing that those are much safer than what we had out there before, which is no bike lane, right? They're a shoulder. And the shoulder was fairly adequate, but it is not very inviting. So those are some of the issues there. Um, we have been talking about overpasses for railroad tracks for a long time. And this, I think the, the original sales tax was really meant to start looking at those things. But as we've evaluated these over time, we're seeing that the over or the underpasses for the railroad track or the railroad tracks are just not feasible or realistic, especially when we start looking at the local businesses that would be impacted by what we're doing. I mean, you really do have to provide a frontage road system plus the underpass for a lot of these businesses to still have access. So you know how much we go through with just loss of parking in front of some businesses for some different ways of, of trying to mitigate some of these issues. So. Um, those are the things that I have for that. I'm not sure about the um, the comment about the access into neighborhoods. I'm not sure if you've driven it more than I have, Jim, but um, I'm not sure 
we'll have to we'll follow up with Scott and just try to find out a little bit more about what that means. Um, what am I missing? Sixty six. Phil, <laughs> we do have PEL or plant. Oh, oh, go ahead. There is one additional item that will take some follow-up from staff. Uh, Mr. Nix referenced their striping changes on eastbound 3rd Avenue as you approach State Highway 119. At a staff level, we'll sit down and we'll have a more in-depth discussion about, about those changes. And Mr. Nix did mention, um, why aren't we doing four lanes on 52 and 66? So both of those state highways have had... Um, Planning and environmental linkage studies, which is almost, it's, it's, it's kind of like an environmental um, evaluation, but it's just a little less than that. But it, it sets us up for all the environmental work that has to happen. And 66 is being looked at as a four-lane facility, at least from um, basically Hoover Street on the west side uh, all the way through into Weld County to I-25, and then probably beyond as a four-lane facility into Firestone and Mead. So that is being looked at on State Highway 66. 52 is a little different animal. It is it is something that where Boulder counties had more say in, in it, and they do not want to see a widen. They, they, don't, they, don't, they don't have road widening projects per se unless it is for transit or for uh, other means. So they do subscribe to Mr. Wicklund's um, thought, thoughts with as far as widening and only for transit, making transit better. But... East of County Line Road, I do believe that Weld County has some ideas of how to add some additional laneage for that portion of the roadway. But it's all in it's all online. We can send you those links. Thank you, everyone. That's great. Just one last comment on sure. on State Highway 66. The city has been working with CDOT and Boulder County um, for um, a a project for widening. Of State Highway 66 from Main Street to the to the west or to the yeah to the west to Hover, uh, that is currently in design. Um, we are uh, working our way through the process. Uh, it is not funded for construction at this time. Thank you. Well, I'll just you know. Everyone, well, yeah, th thank you for being here, the presentations. Um, but really, I, I, don't, I don't have much comments. So, you know, th thank you for your time. I will add my thanks to everyone who's presented to the board this evening. But uh, I've made my comments and have asked my questions and appreciated the answers you've given me. And I'll wrap up just I concur with everything that's been said here and again Monday night coming here and giving up this night to, to show up and as well as Scott Nix for showing up and giving us comments and your input and obviously the historical lesson was, was very very well taken um, so I'll leave it at that and uh, we'll move to comments from council member Yarborough Thank you. Well, I hate I missed the historical piece. Man, that's the key. Um, I just want to say thank you as well. Thank you for the comments. I know, sorry I missed, I was hopping out of one board meeting to another, and unfortunately, that's the story of my life. Um, so thank you for being patient with me, first of all. Uh, you know, I'm still learning a lot about transportation, and I'm, I'm learning about the city and how it operates. One of the things I really want to focus, I myself, is education. You know, as you all were mentioning, that area on Hoover, that underpass, I don't see very many people taking that. You know, and I think a lot of people really don't know that it's there unless they are coming from over there by, what, Sprouts or Elevations or something and then they go under. But um, what I'm finding on city council is that a lot of community members are not educated on the, how accessible the city is and where we're going. Um, so I think it's important that while we're ahead of a lot of things, that we figure out ways to inform 
our community as to what we're doing and also to get a little their input as well uh, what will benefit them I love the idea of the overpass um, to walk across a lot of cities have that um, but then you talk about those with disabilities who may not be as mobile to walk upstairs I don't know how we would do that but that's an awesome idea so my all the comments was were amazing I just want us to really focus on educating our community because you all do all of this amazing work and no one knows about it and so think about when we're putting all this together when you have the consultants and how are we going to inform our community because that's one thing that council hears over and over again in our emails no one knew about it after you completed it so let's put some extra effort if we can to make sure that um, we are intentional in how we deliver the message. So thank you all, appreciate you. Okay, um, items for the upcoming agenda, I guess our next scheduled meeting is gonna be September 12th. Yes, and, and Chair, I failed to put in some items underneath that category, so I apologize, I was kinda of going through the meeting trying to figure out what we've been talking about, see if you guys have had any breaks yet. And I'm seeing that you've not had, except for maybe the May meeting, where some of you still had to work and uh, help with recruitment here for the TAB board. Um, otherwise, we've had meetings every month this year so far. So um, we'll take a look at what, what's coming. We had some things that were supposed to come up that aren't going to be Ready in time, one being the crash report, just because we're missing some data and we can't put together a good report until we have that for you. We usually put that together for you in September. So uh, give us a little time on that. That'll probably be fourth quarter before we bring that back to you. Um, we also had, we, want, we do want to get a formal tip recommendation from this board to city council on the two projects that we do know about, one being the 21st Avenue Main Street underpass design study <laughs> lots, lots going on there and so we we do want to now that we know that there's a high probability of us getting approval for that we'd like to get your recommendation the board's recommendation to take the city council to get their recommendation to spend the money on it and provide that that level of funding so that and the county line road project that i spoke about earlier too to add the the shoulders and the bike lanes to that piece that it's under under i guess the reviewing the consultants at this point to find out which consultant will actually get the job to do the design work on that. We are going for funding on that. So those are the two things that we'll need from you, September, October. Um, and I've just been going through the other list just to make sure we're hitting all your work plan items for this year. And we typically have that annual meeting in, sometimes we say July, but it doesn't seem to make sense to have an annual meeting in the middle of the year when we kind of set your work plan in January. So. Uh, just making sure we're working through that work plan for you. But those are the two, oh, and then there's the sugar mill steam project that I think the project manager for that project wants to come back in front of this board, either September or October. So again, we're thinking about how we give you a break, <laughs> but we wanna certainly get the work done. So uh, we'll let you know uh, as soon as we can get the items together, whether what's going up in September. Thanks for my lengthy conversation on that. No, thank you. <clears throat> and I guess we would need a, um, what, a motion to adjourn our meeting. I will move to adjourn. Second? I'll second. All those in, all those <laughs> in favor, raise your hand. Great, meeting adjourned. Thank you.